Hi, Vagif. Hi, Aaron. Hello. 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 So, Aaron, um, can you to, can you talk uh, to us about maybe uh, a few words about your first steps in in actor model and this all uh, distribution actor actor model world? So, h how you get? Sure. It? Absolutely. Um, I was the uh, founder and uh, CTO of a marketing automation company uh, that was trying to build uh, in-app marketing automation for apps that uh, developers were selling uh, through the Windows Store when Windows 8 launched and on top of Windows Phone as well. And uh, in order to build that system, which operated at very large scale, you know, we had 500 megabytes of event data per second uh, passing through our, our load balancer into our ASP.NET sort of API that we built uh, for collecting all these events and devices. We needed some way to analyze uh, each of the individual users, and there'd be about 30 million of them per day, typically, each of the individual users and what campaigns they might qualify for. And in order to do that, uh, quickly, because that was one of the things that would affect how well our marketing automation would perform for our customers. We needed a way to partition that huge stream of data into lots of individual streams for each uh, individual app user. And it turned out the actor model was a really good way of doing that. Now, this is back in uh, 2013. And unfortunately, uh, there were no actor model tools that were available really for, for .NET developers. Uh, so we decided that the best course of action was to take the one that had been most successful on the Java platform, a uh, Java virtual machine platform, Akka, and actually port it back to C Sharp uh, because our, our team had no real experience building and deploying Java applications. And we were already running under a tremendous uh, load with a relatively small team. So we thought the lesser of two evils was porting Akka to .NET rather than porting our application to Java. So that's ultimately what we what we decided to do here. So it's been about seven years since uh, I started uh, sort of writing my first lines of code on the Akka.net project. Yeah, right decision, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> I should probably it add worked that, out. Uh, sorry, I should probably add that uh, .next actually uh, was one of, probably one of the first international conferences that presented Akka.net. Uh, already in 2015, uh, there was .next conference in St. Petersburg where Russian developer Nikita Tsukhanov uh, had a talk uh, about how to build high, uh, highly scalable applications using Akka.net. It was five years ago. Yeah, you are. Well, yeah. well .next is pretty cutting edge in terms of uh, in terms of the types of technical topics it gets into, and it's always had a uh, a good reputation for being uh, very technically focused. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, can we start? All right. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great. So, uh, so my presentation today is when and how to use the actor model, an introduction to Akka.net. So, you know, my name is Aaron Standard. I'm one of the co-founders of the Akka.net project. I'm also the founder of a company called Petabridge. Uh, we build open source tools to help .NET developers build uh, highly scalable and highly available applications. Akka.net is kind of the center of our business. And uh, I wanted to go ahead and start with a bit of an explanation on the origins of the actor model, uh, where it originally came from. Uh, if you've you know, been paying attention to, uh, let's say, the, the zeitgeist on Twitter or on Hacker News or Reddit, uh, the actor model is something that's showing up uh, much more frequently these days. And so it has the appearance of being a novel concept. But the truth is, the actor model is actually a very old idea in computer science. Uh, originally, the actor model was conceived in 1973. And the reason why computer scientists created it on paper back in the back in the 70s was the vision the computer scientists had for how computing would be done in the future was that we would have living room sized mainframes with thousands of low powered CPUs. And that's how large scale computing would emerge. And so as a result of this sort of vision of, of computing, where we would have you know, machines with uh, thousands of, of, let's say, commodity CPUs running, we needed to come up with an application programming model that prioritized concurrency and multi-core processing as sort of a first-class uh, citizen. And we needed to have that programming model be simple enough that your average programmer could reason about it. 
Uh, for context, the whole idea of concurrent programming was still very new in the field of computer science back in the early 70s. Uh, Edger Dijkstra uh, published a paper in 1965, which is the first real study of concurrent programming. And that's where a lot of synchronization primitives that we use today, like semaphores and mutual exclusion locks and all that stuff came from. And those techniques, which used a shared memory sort of concurrent programming model, uh, were extremely brittle and are still extremely brittle to this day. It's very easy to make mistakes and write code that is fundamentally not thread safe, even if you're very careful and you're very experienced. So the concept that these computer scientists developed in the 1970s was that each actor would be its own microprocess. So you can kind of think of that sort of model we have of you have a parent process that spawns child processes, which is you know, common in modern operating systems today. Uh, the actor model was kind of that on steroids, where processes would be smaller, and each one would go essentially own its own core. Or potentially you could have multiple actors all timeshare off, of, off of a single core in the event that you had more actors than cores potentially. So the idea was that you could have many different actors running on many different cores, each one interacting with the other via passing these messages in shared memory. So actors would each have the little queue of messages that they would need to process, and that queue would be synchronized. That way, the code that the programmers wrote running inside the actors wouldn't need to be. You wouldn't need to have locks or semaphores or any other sort of synchronization uh, mechanisms running inside the actor code that the programmers wrote uh, themselves. The infrastructure of the actual actor programming runtime would be responsible for performing that synchronization inside the actor's queue or, or mailbox that they use for communicating back and forth. And so the way the programmers who envisioned um, how the actor model would work designed it was that actors would be serial processors. They would only process one message at a time, and they would process those messages in the order in which they were sent. This is a very intuitive way of thinking about software. Uh, processing a queue and in, in, in processing those messages one at a time is very easy for a programmer to reason about. So this would greatly simplify what the process of developing concurrent software would look like. And so as the vision went, you would have your program. This might be the foreground application that an end user would launch, or maybe it'd be launched on a scheduler uh, by the operating system. This program could deploy actors that would each own kind of a different area of responsibility. And these actors could in turn deploy additional child actors. And these actors would essentially be assigned to one or you know, one core uh, that would be running on uh, this giant mainframe. Well, as the program executed, these actors would be would, would start receiving messages, and these messages would cause the actor to be scheduled for execution on the CPU, and they would actually go ahead and begin doing some processing under the covers. And as those actors completed their processing, they would send some response messages uh, back to, you know, let's say one of the, the top level actors, the actors that are created uh, by the main thread of execution. And then those actors could deliver the results back to the program. So maybe that data would be written out to the console, or maybe that data would be written out to another actor who might do things like uh, collate all the output and write it to a file. So this was the original vision for the actor model in 1973. And just to give you an idea of how old this really is, the original relational database white paper was only written two years earlier, in 1971. So this is a very old concept in computing. But why have we never heard of it really until recently? Why has it been such a, a dormant concept? Well, we have Moore's Law to thank for that. The way computing systems evolved in the 1970s and 80s wasn't these giant living room sized computers with thousands of cheap CPUs. What we ended up with are very compact computers that were in you know, desktop towers originally, then eventually laptops and mobile phones, where we had a very small number of cores with a very large number of transistors. So Moore's law eliminated the need for us to have to go back and build these sophisticated multi-core programming architectures for a long time. That began to change in the 1980s though. 
With the introduction of network computing, uh, which really kind of emerged in the early 1980s, and then started getting popularized by the mid and late 1980s, this created a new need that the actor model could uniquely address. The first real commercial implementation of actors uh, came, uh, came as a result of some of the work that Ericsson was doing in the 1980s. Ericsson was tasked with building some of the first uh, digital telephony networks for uh, handling cellular communication and that type of thing. And they needed a system that could scale as the network grew over a long period of time. So for instance, uh, if we had a, um, you know, a, a, a very small set of cellular subscribers in a big city like Moscow in 1986, you could go ahead and imagine that by 10 years later, you would have many orders of magnitude, more people using that network, and they'd be using it more heavily. So the original developers at Ericsson wanted to have a system that could scale horizontally over time, where they could go ahead and grow the amount of hardware that's using to serve the network without having to have their software engineers constantly re-architecting it all the time. Turns out that the actor model was a very robust solution for that. Uh, in addition to being able to provide hardware scalability, the actor model did two other important things for Ericsson. The first is that, as you can imagine, a telephony application is a what we call a soft real-time application, where the application doesn't act, you know, explicitly fail if a message doesn't get delivered on time, but the quality of the service degrades pretty rapidly. So you can imagine if there's a high degree of latency on a call, where you know it takes me a set of milliseconds to go ahead and get voice packets back from the other person I'm speaking to. Let's say it took single digit seconds instead. As a result of that, uh, my call quality might become unusable and I may not be able to use the network. So actors are very robust at being able to implement that type of soft real-time programming. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about why later. But the other important thing that actors do is they provide a high degree of fault tolerance. In the event that an exception occurred, maybe one of those actors that was processing actors voice that was and data packets over the network might fail, but um, one of those actors might fail, but all of the, uh, the, the, the other piece of packets that were waiting in the actor's mailbox could still be reliably delivered after the actor restarted. So you might hear, a, let's say, a, a slight crack in the quality of the audio, but the call isn't going to be dropped. So actors provide that high degree of availability. And so as a result of the work that the Ericsson software developers did, they created a virtual runtime and a programming language now known today as Erlang. Uh, Erlang would eventually be open sourced in the early 1990s. I think 1991 was when they open sourced it. Now, as the internet grew, and in addition, as, a, as modern processor architectures changed, there became a greater and greater need for having more robust uh, concurrent programming tools. In particular, you can see on this chart right here, I'm gonna use my mouse for a second. You can see that around the year 2004, that the clock frequency of CPUs leveled out. So we weren't able to fit more transistors onto a single die anymore. And the reason why is because of physics. As a result, if we tried to go ahead and crowd more and more transistors onto a single die, uh, the heat loss, excuse me, the heat that was given off as a result of increasing those clock speeds and everything else would actually uh, begin to warp the silicon. And so the chip would fail over a period of time. So what chip manufacturers started to do is down here, within about a year of experiencing this plateau in clock speeds in the early 2000s, uh, what we began to see was the emergence of more multi-core uh, CPU architectures. So as a result of this change, developers and programming language designers and companies that build development tools like Microsoft had to start offering better and better tools for being able to reason about concurrent programming. And so in the modern day, actors are now becoming increasingly commonplace. They're becoming really a first class citizen for doing application development. This is largely because multi-core programming is now ubiquitous. Um, most, and or not most, but many of the big language features that have been getting introduced into C Sharp, for instance, have all been about trying to simplify asynchronous and concurrent programming. This is via language constructs like async await or new interfaces like iAsync enumerable and that type of thing. 
But in addition to uh, multi-core programming now becoming ubiquitous, there's an increasingly um, urgent business need to come up with a more robust model for writing concurrent software than the dominant shared state concurrent programming model. Shared state concurrent programming basically requires multiple things to run it concurrently, and then you have to synchronously uh, mo say, uh, modify the state that your application depends on using tools like locks, semaphores, reader writer locks, and that sort of thing. And that programming model is notoriously difficult to do correctly. But the real thing that has brought the actor model uh, back into uh, the forefront of modern day application development is really cloud computing. Cloud computing it was, is the absolute realization of this vision the computer scientists in the 1970s had for how bulk computing would be done. A large number of commodity CPUs all working concurrently together to solve really large problems. Actors still work very well across this model. It's just that we had to wait for you know, Amazon to go ahead and come along and create uh, AWS uh, before we were able to go ahead and really tap into this idea of being able to summon uh, cheap commodity CPUs on demand and scale out our programming across it. So that's kind of the history of the Acta model and where we are today. Uh, now, the next thing I want to touch on is the Acta model is out there, and there's some very specific use cases that the Acta model supports really, really well. And what are those? Well, the benefits of the Acta model start with their ability to take a really big problem and break it down into lots of small ones that can be executed concurrently. So I mentioned, you know, at, at the start of our talk, my uh, marketing automation company where we have this gigantic fire hose of events from tens of millions of Windows Phone and Windows 8 devices all coming into our API. And in order for us to effectively manage marketing automation campaigns for each of the individual users in our system, we needed to have a way to split that big fire hose of events and into lots of small individualized uh, streams. And so, what the actor model can do really well is it's really good at partitioning data. So imagine if we have like an IoT scenario where you know, we've got a lot of customers that use Aka.net for things like uh, gathering data from power meters that are connected to tens of millions of homes in Europe, in the United States, and in Asia. And in that case, you might have, let's say, one type of actor that is the aggregate root of all power meters of this particular type, where they behave a little differently than power meters of type B. And then underneath this actor, the, this device type A actor, I might have some children that represent each of the individual instances of that device type. And so as this big fire hose of events arrives inside my actor system, I can go ahead and separate out all the events that have, let's say, a property that indicates that this was produced by a device of type A, I can route all those messages to this type A actor on the left. And then when this type A actor receives those events, it can inspect the ID of the individual device that produced this message, and it can go ahead and route that message to the actor that owns that specific device on the network. And if we're doing something like smart power meter stuff, we might go ahead and use those events to do things like compute uh, the invoices uh, based on the amount of electricity that particular power meter uh, used, how much it consumed. Well, if I have a second type of device in my network, type B, I can go ahead and split those messages off to this actor. And then for each individual device of that type, I can go ahead and create an individual device B with an ID of three or an ID of four. Those actors can go ahead and process the messages that were generated by those specific devices. And all of these actors on the screen, they can all run concurrently. Aka.net or really any actor model implementation will allow us to go ahead and run all of the units of work that, are, that belong to each of these actors concurrently. So this gives us a model where a programmer can go ahead and write an actor that's specific for, that, that's specific for managing a single instance of a specific device type. And then we can just run tens of thousands or even millions of them in parallel. And this allows us to take a really big problem and break it down to lots of small ones that are easy to reason about. So that's kind of the first big benefit of the actor model. 
The second big benefit of the actor model is that actors are reactive. Actors are capable of building stateful applications where all of the data you need to do work is adjacent in memory to the code that does the work. And this is the key for building those soft real-time applications like Ericsson's digital telephony network or my marketing automation application where this actor has some state and that state's just the fields and properties of the actor class that you write as an Akadana developer. As this actor receives events uh, via its mailbox, it has the ability to modify its state each time it processes one of these events. Well, eventually, after the actor observes a state change from, let's say, state one to state two, the actor's code might say, okay, when you observe this state change occur, we need to push a new notification out to somewhere else in the system. Maybe we need to send a notification to an external client that's connected via their mobile phone. Maybe we need to send an email to a, a, someone, some stakeholder in our customer's organization. Or maybe we need to fire a notification to another service somewhere and get it to perform some additional work for us behind the scenes. The ability to do this is extremely powerful. It means that we can avoid having to pull data out of a database or having to scan uh, for events inside a log somewhere. What we can do is we can just accumulate state in memory in real time. So all of this activity can happen on the order of microseconds inside our application. And as a result of that, we're able to react to changes in state in real time and we can do all of this without having to create any external infrastructure. We don't necessarily need a database or a service broker or a queuing system or anything like that. All of this work can be done with just the core Akka DLL in the Akka.NET NuGet package. So this is one of the reasons why actors are really popular for real-time applications like multiplayer video games, for instance. It's really easy to go ahead and model all of the different in-game assets such as you know, player characters or NPCs or environment effects. It's easy to model those as actors. And when the players interact with those objects, those objects, let's say if you drain all the health of an NPC and you kill it, well, when that NPC observes its state for its health uh, go negative or goes to zero, it can go ahead and trigger a reaction that signals that this NPC is now dead and maybe the player gets some experience points or some loot or something else. That's sort of one really simple example, but you can also apply that to more enterprise examples like IoT and or let's say uh, foreign currency trading or anything else. Now, all of this is kind of leading up to the fact that actors are really good at simplifying the experience of concurrent programming. And the trick behind this is the fact that actors are serial processors. Each individual actor has its own queue of messages. In Akka.net, we call this queue of messages a mailbox. The actor, which is the piece of code that you author as the Akka.net developer, that actor can only process its messages from the mailbox in a serial order, uh, one at a time. So as the actor receives the oldest message in its mailbox, the message that's at the front of the queue, the actor will go ahead and process that message. And once the actor is finished processing that message, meaning its receive method exits, we'll go ahead and move on to the next message in the queue and process that. So the actor can modify its state. It can even persist copies of its state to a database. It can make external service calls. You can do whatever you want inside an actor's code. But the trick is, is that because the actor only processes messages serially, Anything the actor does while it's processing that message is guaranteed to be thread safe. In other words, there's no uh, side effects. You don't have to worry about someone else concurrently reading or writing your state. You have full control over that as the Akadana developer. And so everything you do inside your actor, you can go ahead and assume that is safe because the concurrency model guarantees that for actors. Let's see. Next big benefit of actors is that they're really good at isolating faults. Actors live in a hierarchy that looks a little bit like a family tree or an org chart. So you have uh, a root process, that's this actor here. This actor is actually created directly by Akka.net. 
And then you have some child processes. So you have these top level ones here, these parent actors, and they can go ahead and spawn children. It's not all that uncommon in some applications for one parent actor to have hundreds of thousands of children. Um, that happens in cases where you might be dynamically creating actors uh, to model entities that are being created on the fly by your end users. Uh, that happens quite a bit. So any one of those actors, if this actor cr crashes, and when an actor crashes, by the way, what we mean is that actor threw an unhandled exception. So threw an exception without trying to wrap it inside a try-catch block. Well, if this actor crashes, it's going to go ahead and propagate its exception up to its parent. And so the actor model uses a parental supervision strategy where the parent actor decides how to handle the failures of its children. And when this actor crashes, it has no side effects on any of the other actors at this level of the hierarchy. So this parent actor will, by default, typically choose to restart that actor, where restarting is actually a fairly lightweight operation in Akka.net. You're going to lose all of the state uh, inside your actor's properties and field start, uh, but you're not going to lose any of the messages inside your mailbox. And any of the actor references, which are the little handles that we use for talking to actors, and we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, any of the actor references that point to this actor who crashed are still going to keep pointing to it even after it restarts. So a restart is like a type of transparent operation behind the scenes. This means that it's really easy for us to build systems that are capable of self-healing, where if something goes seriously wrong, we can go ahead and try to reboot that actor back into a well-known safe state. This is considered to be a more robust form of error handling than what most functional and procedural programmers do which is where they try to dig themselves out of a failed state using try-catch blocks and exception handlers. The original philosophy of the Erlang developers who really pioneered this technique was, you know, the most st standard way of handling a crashed process is typically just letting that process crash and restarting it. You're going to get more predictable and more reliable behavior that way. We should apply that same approach to actors where when an actor crashes, we're going to reboot it back into a well-known safe state. And that state's going to be defined as whatever that state that actor was in when it first began. If you're using a tool like Akada Persistence, that state's going to be defined as the last state the actor successfully saved to the durable store, usually a database that it was using. The actor will go ahead and reboot itself back into that state and resume processing messages again. This is kind of a more predictable way of reasoning about failures, particularly in an asynchronous and concurrent environment than that traditional try-catch block, dig your way out of an exception approach. The other big benefits of actors are that they're really good at scaling and distribution. This is what an Akadot cluster network might look like, where we have four different processes, each one hosting its own little hierarchy of actors all working together cooperatively to solve a problem. Node one is using a router, which is a type of actor that's responsible for distributing messages. It doesn't do any processing itself. It just figures out uh, which of its routees uh, should be responsible for processing messages. Well, this router can distribute messages to this user slash foo actor on node two, node four, and node three. So we have the ability to go ahead and dynamically distribute that work. And guess what? If node four left the network because this process shut down, then we would stop sending work to this actor. We'd redistribute that work to the other two nodes who are still available for processing. Which kind of brings me to my last big benefit here, which is that in addition to isolating faults that occur within a single process, actors are also really good at routing away from failures that occur on the network level as well. So let's imagine we have six processes that are all responsible for working cooperatively together to solve some business problem. And each one of them has a hierarchy of actors under the covers. Well, suppose node F has some critical business state on it and node F abruptly crashes. It's no longer available on the network. Well, Akadot cluster and all the other actors that are responsible for monitoring some of the actors that live on the state are all going to receive a notification right away that this node is no longer responding. 
it, uh, we, we maybe our TCP connections all got disrupted. So we know that our socket's been broken. Or maybe we go ahead and just stop receiving responses back from Node F. We don't get any more heartbeat messages from it. Well, what the actor system will do is after a period of time, it'll decide that Node F is not coming back, that it's not going to be able to respond to any requests. And therefore, any of the work that we previously sent to Node F needs to be routed to Node D instead. And we're going to go ahead and share all that work and send it back to Node D. And Node D will recover some of the state that Node F has using a tool like Akadot Persistence. We'll go ahead and recover that data from a database of some kind. Uh, now, in the real world, if Node F failed, would probably, and let's assume all these nodes implemented the same code, would probably uh, redistribute its responsibilities evenly across all five of these nodes. But that's much harder to draw. So I decided to draw it a little bit simpler way this way. So these are all kind of the big benefits of the actor model so far. Now, the first question that we have from the audience here is what are the benefits that Akadotnet has over the TPL? Well, the TPL, Task and Parallelism Library, uh, the TPL has, let's say, the closest thing that the TPL has to actors is probably the TPL data flow, where you have the ability to go ahead and construct different types of blocks together that all use tasks to go ahead and propagate data back and forth. One thing the TPL does not have in it is any intrinsic concept of how to manage state. The TPL is all about actually doing the work, all about concurrency. It's about waiting on one task to complete and starting another when the previous one finishes. Or it's about composing multiple tasks together. If you want to be able to specify something like, I want to make a web service call to these two different web services, and when both of them finishes, then I want to do this thing. The actor model gives you the ability to reason about all the same things the TPL does, but it also gives you a model for easily partitioning state and data in a way that is automatically thread safe. So that's probably the biggest benefit over it is actors include the ability to reason about state. The other thing the actor model can do above and beyond the TPL is it has the ability to transparently do the same types of concurrent work that it can do locally in one process. Actors make it very easy to do that transparently over the network as well. So the actor model is kind of a step up uh, from the TPL in terms of the amount of tools and power that it gives you and the amount of things that it can do. Uh, but you do pay for that because the actor model has more conceptual overhead to it than what the TPL does. Uh, it's fairly intuitive to go ahead and understand the idea of waiting on a task to complete before you do the next thing. Whereas sending a stream of messages to an actor and waiting to receive anywhere from zero to n responses back, that's not quite as easy to reason about out of the gate. So there are some trade-offs between those two. But both the TPL and Akka.net are commonly used together inside real production Akka.net applications. Now, another group of questions that uh, folks in the audience might have is what are the actual business domains where actors really get used? Actors tend to get used in domains where soft real-time guarantees are common. And so the way that might be expressed is like every transaction must be completed within 100 milliseconds to be within the service level agreement we have with our users. So a good example of this, if you're building a, let's say real-time trading platform, uh, where you're trying to match uh, people's orders to buy maybe a bit of cryptocurrency or maybe to buy stocks or bonds, you have to have a guarantee that every time a user submits an order, if they submit a market order, that order must be matched within, let's say, 10 milliseconds. Otherwise, things like high frequency trading, if you want to be able to support that, or algorithmic trading aren't really capable. Um, other examples of soft real-time guarantees might be things like if you're building a personalization system for an e-commerce website, you need to be able to guarantee that within, let's say, a couple of seconds of a user clicking on different items on your e-commerce website, you need to be able to start making personalized recommendations for what sort of what sort of products you want to show that user. That way, you can try to improve your conversion rate and sell more product through your site. Uh, soft real soft real time guarantees are actually becoming an increasingly common type of business requirement. Uh, in particular, 
things like the real-time web, where signal R and other push mediums are becoming more and more common, uh, kind of make it so users are starting to expect more real-time behavior. They want to receive notifications back in real time when someone you know, uh, interacts with their post on a social media account. Or they want to receive a real-time notification when someone tries to message them in a messaging application and that type of thing. Those types of domains uh, complement actors really, really well. This is why services like WhatsApp, for instance, are actually written on top of Erlang in a lot of cases. Other domains where actors are frequently used are ones where the work is best modeled as streams. So streaming workflows don't necessarily just mean, uh, let's say, intermittent sort of uh, continuous flows. So good examples of that include things like IoT, marketing automation, real-time pricing, where you have a constant stream of activity coming into your system and you have to continuously partition it, uh, update the data for all the different entities that are participating in that stream, and then some of those entities have to react and produce output. That's sort of what most people think of as streaming workflows, but it's also possible to take work that was traditionally modeled as batch processes, uh, such as asset line management, simulations, ETL, big data migrations. You can actually make systems much more efficient at carrying out those big batch jobs by breaking up your batch into a long running stream. So to give you a couple of examples from our customers, we have a number of customers in the field of asset line management. Uh, this is a thing that banks do where banks have a portfolio of mortgages, or maybe it might be an insurance company that has a portfolio of different insurance premiums they collect. And they're gonna have to analyze how much more valuable is this group of mortgages than this one based on things like the types of assets that are being mortgaged, uh, the credit worthiness of the lenders, and they need to go ahead and run these reports, let's say once a month, uh, to go ahead and produce financial statements for the bank. Uh, this is like something that the bank's chief financial officer would use. Uh, in other cases, we have a lot of customers that are work in industries like insurance or they'll go ahead and, and use Aka.net to run simulations to predict things like the patterns of hurricanes. And here, you know, I, I live in Texas where we have a lot of hurricanes every year. You might go ahead and use that to predict flood damage. Or uh, we have a lot of customers in sports betting. They use simulations to go ahead and try to predict the most likely spread on, let's say, a football match. That way they can set the initial price when they first start taking bets from users. So these are examples of different types of streaming models where actors tend to be very effective at helping developers build these applications correctly. Finally, the other area where actors get used pretty commonly is in business areas where high availability is key to business success. So, you know, we used the example earlier of telephony, uh, making sure that our, our phone system is available and is able to route as many packets as possible correctly to the end user, that is being able to route most of them is more important than being able to route all of them because we need to keep the latency of the network relatively low. Other business domains, such as you know, foreign currency trading, which, have, which you know, a lot of European banks have to do continuously, or let's say uh, IoT or monitoring, these are all things that people use Aka.net for. Availability is the key to all those different business domains. And actors are really good at being able to ensure that. So this is kind of where actors get used. And I'm going to look at a real world use case a little bit later in this presentation. But next, let's go ahead and actually talk about Aka.net and how it relates to the actor model and how we can actually use it. So Aka.net is, of course, a framework, which means it consists of multiple different NuGet packages, each of which introduces some new behaviors you can add to your application. The core Akka NuGet package is what we use to define all of the actor base types. So if you want to go ahead and, you know, let's say create an actor, you're going to need to install the Akka NuGet package, and that'll go ahead and give you the base classes you can inherit from to define actors. It's also where all the configuration types are defined, all the serialization system, that's all defined inside the core Akka package. Uh, next, we have Akka.remote. This is what allows actors in one process to communicate with other actors in a second process somewhere else over the network. So this allows actors to communicate transparently via their actor references over a TCP connection, typically. 
Uh, next, we have Akada Persistence. This allows actors to make their state durable. So if an actor it crashes or if an actor gets moved from one node to another, uh, that actor can recover its state and re-enter the previous state that it was in. So Akada Persistence is kind of our framework for trying to help simplify uh, that state persistence and recovery function. Uh, then we have Akadot Cluster. Most of the talks I give about Akadot.net are typically about building applications on top of Akadot Cluster. If you want to build a highly available application, Akadot Cluster is going to be the tool that you use. This allows you to build a peer-to-peer -peer network where all the nodes in the network are equal to each other in terms of their rank inside the system, and they're all capable of performing similar types of work. So Akadot Cluster kind of gives us the ability to describe a network of different processes that might have different custom actor types built into them. So one node inside the cluster can do one type of work, and a different node can do other types. And then we have some other abstractions, such as Akka Streams, uh, which uh, Vagif has given some presentations on before, which is a way of building streaming workflows uh, on top of actors. It's kind of like a higher level abstraction on top of Akka.net. Uh, the syntax for Aka Streams looks a little bit like Link, like a language integrated. So we're not going to get into all this today, but this is kind of the menu of some of the things that Aka.net offers. Now, this is what a basic actor looks like in Aka.net. The first thing we're going to do is inherit from one of the actor base types, and there's several in Aka.net. But the most commonly used one is the receive actor. The receive actor is used because it offers these strongly typed receive statements right here. Well, I'm going to go and specify the type of message I want to receive. I'm going to create a little handler, this lambda function right here. Every time my ping actor receives a ping message, it's going to invoke this line of code right here. I can define multiple receives for multiple different types of messages if I want. So I might have a... Um, a ping and a pong message, and both of those can have totally different typed receives under the covers. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the really useful things about actors is the fact that actors have internal state. This is what allows them to be reactive. In our case, our internal state right here is just a handle to the logging system. So we're gonna go ahead and create a logging adapter, which is an Aka.net construct. And anytime we go ahead and write out to the log, that's gonna go ahead and create an event that's going to get published to all the different logging actors inside our system. So we might have one actor that, that uh, logs to the console. We might have a second one that uses a library like Serialog to write out to you know, an elk stack somewhere, uh, whatever the case may be. Next, inside this actor, we're actually going to use the scheduler in Aka.net. We have basically a fairly precise high-frequency scheduler in Aka.net. And we're going to go ahead and say, you know what? I'm going to compute a random delay somewhere between one and five seconds. And I'm going to send a reply message right here back to the sender. This sender is a reference to the actor who sent us this message. So this allows me to transparently go and reply back to the actor who sent me this message under the covers. So this is kind of the real basics of what knocking on an actor looks like. The way we go and create and host these actors together is we have to define an actor system first. So this actor system is kind of the, the address space all the actors are going to use for sending messages back and forth. If the actor system gets disposed, then all the actors that are hosted inside the actor system will be shut down with them. Next, in order to start an actor, we have to create some props. You know, an actor needs props in order to act. The prompts is basically a recipe that tells us how to start an actor. It tells us which constructor to use to instantiate an actor. It also helps tell us what are the constructor arguments we need to pass in. And this props class is immutable. I can use the same ping actor props to start a million different ping actors if I want to. So that's what this is for. In order for us to actually start this actor and begin having it do work, I'm gonna take this props class I created and I'm going to pass it into the actor of method right here. And I can also optionally give this actor a name. Uh, this name will show up in the address this actor has on the network somewhere, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then finally, if I want to go ahead and cause this actor to do some work, I'm going to go ahead and send a ping message to the ping actor here. This is actually an asynchronous invocation under the covers here. I'm going to tell this ping actor 
this message. And this tell method is void. It doesn't return anything. But that actor will not process that message until a future point in time. So all the tell method is really doing is queuing that message into the actor's mailbox. And there's no guarantee that the actor is going to process that message immediately. Uh, the actor might take, let's say, a microsecond or maybe you know, uh, ha a handful of nanoseconds to get scheduled before it can actually go and process that message. So message processing is always asynchronous by default on Aka.net. And this is the sort of way you actually go ahead and start that process. Is you go ahead and tell the ping actor this message, that message will be queued to the back of the actor's mailbox, and the actor will be scheduled for execution at a future point in time, and the actor will typically process a burst of up to 30 messages, depending on how many are in its mailbox. We do that, we, we limit the burst of messages an actor can process, so we don't accidentally starve other actors that are waiting to do work. This kind of helps us uh, maintain a level of fair scheduling inside the system. So when this actor processes this ping message after it gets scheduled for execution, that ping code you saw us have earlier will get run. Now, a couple of key actor terms. The actor class that we defined, our ping actor in this case, that actor, that class is basically just a message processor. It includes the instructions for the different messages it can process and talks about how it's going to process them. And that actor can also contain some state that, it's, that it might modify in the course of processing some of those messages. An actor reference is our handle to an actor. Actor references are what allow us to communicate with an actor. It allows us to communicate with this actor without needing to know its implementation type or its location on the network. So I can have an iActorref for an actor that is local or an actor that's remote. And the way I'm going to communicate with that actor reference is the same, regardless of whether the actor is local or remote. If the actor is remote, Aka.net will serialize that message, send it over a TCP connection uh, to the process that actor is hosted inside of, and then deserialize that message and then route the message to the actor we're addressing. So actor references are our interface for being able to talk to individual actors. All those actors are each hosted inside an actor system. Uh, typically, you have one actor system per process, although it's totally allowed for multiple actor systems to run simultaneously inside a single process if you want. Uh, we do that inside some of our examples in the Aka.net uh, project. Uh, but in a production situation, uh, one actor system usually means one process. So in the case of the example I'm going to show a little bit later, we have one actor system running inside each of the Kubernetes pods that we're hosting our application inside of. And then finally, we have the concept of a cluster. A cluster is a group of actor systems that are all networked together uh, via TCP connections to each other. And so this is how we form a highly available network using Akadot cluster. So a cluster is a network of actor systems that all have the ability to freely communicate with each other's actors. That's what that is. Now, a couple of things worth mentioning about how actors behave. Actors always run asynchronously. When this actor receives a message, it's going to get scheduled for execution uh, on the .NET thread pool by default. That actor will process a burst of messages, and the course of processing those messages, the actor might do things like send another message to a different actor, and that actor might subsequently get scheduled for execution as well. So when actors don't have any messages to process, they don't use any CPU at all. They'll use memory. They'll go ahead and sit around available in memory for a period of time, but they're not going to use any CPU resources at all. So that's why a lot of users will have a large number of actors running inside their application at any given time. Even though you might have, let's say, half a million actors per process, only a few thousand of them might be doing work at any given time. And actors are very fast in Aka.net, by the way. On a uh, D2V2 VM on Windows Azure, which is a pretty old piece of hardware at this point, it's probably five or six years old, Aka.net actors can do about four and a half million messages per second per core. So you can have two actors on one, you know, let's say physical CPU, uh, both processing four and a half million messages a second there. On my computer, which is a nice AMD Ryzen machine, I can process about 5.6 million messages per second. Uh, so 
actors are very fast. Message processing does not have a huge amount of overhead in Aka.net. Now, the next point is that the way we share state, since we don't have access to actors' private fields, actor references kind of prevent us from being able to directly invoke methods on an actor. Uh, state is always shared through messages inside the actor system. So if actor B wants a copy of actor A's state, what's going to happen is actor A is going to make a copy of its state. It's going to make an immutable copy that it's going to go ahead and place inside a message and route back to actor B. You don't want to share a mutable object between actor A and actor B because we're right back to having shared state concurrency again, where we need to worry about side effects and synchronization mechanisms. So what typically uh, programmers will do with Aka.net is they'll design their actor state such that it can, you can easily make a deep copy of it on the fly, or you might use an immutable data structure in the first place. So that immutable data structure might be, for instance, a class with a bunch of read-only fields and a bunch of read-only collections on it. And the only way to go ahead and modify it is by, by essentially um, by being able to go ahead and, uh, well, the only way to go ahead and modify it is essentially creating a new one and passing those new values into the constructor. So if a new state change arrives, actor A might update its state, but actor B is still going to receive the copy of the state actor A sent at the time it was available. Now, if you want to design your application in such a way where as soon as actor A updates its state, actor B wants to notify about it, guess what? That's very simple to do in Aka.net. Instead of using request response messaging, where I send a request and you send me a response back, we can do publish subscribe messaging instead, which is trivial to implement in Aka.net. Actor B can tell actor A, send me a copy of your state right now and let me know about any changes in your state. And with that type of messaging contract in Aka.net, all the changes to actor A's state will be automatically streamed to actor B. Now, the other big benefit of this with, with actor references and the way actors work in Aka.net is actor references are location transparent. What we mean by that is, this is Michael Douglas from the 1980s movie Wall Street, and he's holding a giant 1980s style cell phone. Cell phones are location transparent because your phone number hides your physical location in the cell network somewhere. Actor references work the same way. I have a reference to an actor, but I don't necessarily need to know where that actor is in the network at all. That actor reference can point to a local actor that's inside the same actor system as myself, or can point to a remote actor running in another remote process. As a developer, I don't need to explicitly know or care which is which, and you're going to notice in any actor code you review that none of the developers are explicitly including, let's say, addressing information about those actors. We're not basically trying to manually construct addresses the same way we would if we we're working with an HTTP or a gRPC client, systems that are not location transparent under the covers. But even though actor references are location transparent, the actual actors themselves that the actors point to actually do have real network addresses, where that actor is going to have a protocol which indicates what transport we can use to communicate with it. So Aka.net by default uses a TCP transport, but it's also possible you might want to use, let's say, a custom transport that uses a gRPC or maybe 0MQ or maybe UDP sockets. Then we have, let's say, the name of the actor system. Then we have the inbound uh, IP address and port or the host name and port that this actor system is accepting incoming connections on. And then finally, we have all the different little parts that make up the actor's path here, where we have the top level actor, um, the user actor, and then we might have, if there's a grandchild uh, down here, it'd be slash user slash actor name one slash whatever the grandchild's name is. So all actors are guaranteed to have at least one globally unique address inside Aka.net cluster. And that's kind of a function of the addressing system that Aka.net has. So in terms of the way Aka.net works, uh, we typically don't need to know, or nor do we want to know, what an actor's address is. But if we need to look up an actor by its address, because maybe we don't have a reference to it yet, there's still a method for doing that. And that's typically what's called an actor selection, is the tool that we can use for querying an actor based on its URL. 
Now, most ACA.NET processes contain many actors. Typically, we have a root actor, this slash user actor right here. And that root actor might have, let's say, a child, this slash A actor, A1. And that actor might have a grandchild. What the actor hierarchy is for is for partitioning work inside our system, where the higher up you are in the actor hierarchy, the bigger your responsibilities are. So like in my IoT example I had earlier, the top level actor was responsible for managing all data for all devices. The next actor underneath it managed data for one device type. And then the children underneath that actor managed an individual device of that type. The actor hierarchy allows us to break down a big problem into lots of smaller, more manageable ones, where the amount of code you have to write gets smaller and smaller the further you go down the actor hierarchy. So rather than needing to have a big, complicated piece of code to manage all the work that's going on, you end up with a very simple piece of code that helps you split the work up into smaller units that can run concurrently. And you go ahead and you create a child actor to own the lowest unit of work. And those actors can go ahead and do their processing and then shut themselves down when they're finished or shut themselves down when they haven't received a message in a while. That's pretty common too. It's not uncommon for ACA.NET applications to have millions of actors running inside of them. As like I mentioned earlier, uh, the way those actors get executed in practice is only a very small number of them tend to be executing at any given second. When you're taking a look at, let's say, the slice of actors that are being scheduled on the CPU, only a small number of them might be doing work. This is totally dependent on which entities are receiving messages and which ones aren't. So this is kind of the, the ACA.NET and the actor model in theory so far. Now we have a few minutes left, um, and I want to talk a little bit about a real-world example of using ACA.NET actors in practice that our company is doing. So we recently launched a new uh, service called SDK Bin. Uh, it's basically the app store meets NuGet. Uh, we're going to eventually support other types of packages like NPM and other things like that. But we actually need to use ACA.NET in quite a few places in SDK Bin's construction. In particular, the business case I'm going to show you today is our fulfillment system, where fulfillment requires us to provision a NuGet feed to a customer every time they buy a product. It requires us to go ahead and process a payment via credit card typically, and then generate an invoice. Uh, we have to go ahead and send out email notifications to the customer or the publisher. Uh, we might also have to schedule a renewal, depending on whether it's a monthly or a yearly subscription. Maybe a customer bought a subscription that's, a, that's uh, you know, for a couple years. And then we have other stuff we have to think about, such as taxes and payouts. So these are other things we need to think about too. Well, this is a great example of a problem we can model with actors. In our case, we don't really have a soft real-time processing constraint here, other than we, we do want to try to process some, someone's payment immediately if we can. That would be great. And then provision their product as soon as we get it. Uh, that is that is nice, but that's not really the real goal here. What we really have is a high availability problem. We have to make sure that if a customer sends us their payment information, we need to make sure we absolutely can process it. There's, there can't be any excuses for going down in the system even if there's, let's say, a network partition or a network error that happens in our system. We have to absolutely make sure we take the customer's money and give them their product. And so that's what we're building using ACA.NET actors in this case. So the way this works is we are building a state machine. Effectively, it's type of, like a type of saga pattern under the covers where a customer is going to create a purchase intent when they select a product in their shopping system. Every time a customer changes the line items, which are, let's say, the different products they might want to purchase all at once, we're going to have to compute the price of what, they're, what it's going to cost to complete this order, and we're going to report that back to the user. And if the user you know, creates an order and then abandons their cart where they don't complete checkout, we're going to eventually cancel this order. Maybe we'll send the user an email, or maybe we'll go ahead and let the publisher know that someone was looking at it, uh, whatever the case may be. If the customer actually submits a payment uh, and that, pay, you know, that payment uh, sort of gets record gets created, we're going to go ahead and wait for our payment processor to reply back to us that the funds cleared. Once that happens, we can fulfill the user's product, uh, deliver our notifications, and then mark the order as complete at the end. 
So the way this looks from a network architecture perspective is we have a couple of public services, these user services right here. This is our real sort of web front end uh, that users actually interact with. And these user services are gonna be sitting in a cluster with our fulfillment service, where these order actors are gonna actually process that state machine I just showed you earlier. So when a user selects at least one product to buy on a user service, we're gonna to talk to our payment processor, Stripe. Although it might be possible we might, might have multiple payment processors in the future, uh, Stripe's gonna be the one that we are starting off with here. So user selects at least one product, and Stripe returns what's called an intent ID, which represents an order that is in a open state, but we don't yet have any payment information for it. So that intent ID is gonna be the canonical identity of this order we're gonna to try to process. And we're gonna create an order actor on the fulfillment service here, one order actor per order. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is based on the items in the user's cart, which we're gonna receive here, we're gonna return a computed price. The price might be different on a per customer basis because the publisher who's selling through SDK bin might have, let's say, given them a discount or maybe created a, a, a letter of credit or something like that. Um, it kind of, or maybe there's a special offer where you can bundle multiple products together. Uh, the business rules can vary. Either way, this actor has to run those business rules and compute the price we need to show to the user. That price might also include things like sales tax. Now, if the user submits payment, which they'll do via a credit card, that'll go ahead and create a new payment ID. And that payment ID will get mapped to the intent ID. Now, the time between submitting the payment and the payment getting cleared is very fast. We're talking milliseconds usually. But it's possible, depending on the payment methods we support, for instance, we support wire transfers, those payment methods take days to complete rather than milliseconds like how you would with a credit card. So we need to send back a payment ID back to our fulfillment service here. And now that we know this user has tried to pay for this order, we need to save all this actor's state. And we're gonna do that by persisting that state to Azure Table Storage here. So for the next phase, we're gonna go ahead and wait for to send us a webhook that lets us know when payment clears. So that webhook will get our user service here. That user service will go ahead and route that message back to the fulfillment service here, indicating that the payment has cleared for intent ID, which means that uh, we know how much money has been moved is going to be moved into our bank account for our, our service. Well, when that occurs, I can go ahead and say, all right, now it is time to give the user their product. We're going to go ahead and provision the user's product now. And we're also going to go ahead and push an invaded event to Azure Event Hub. When that happens, this actor has now done its work. The user has successfully received their product and the user has also received their invoice and that actor can go ahead and, and shut itself down and we're never gonna need to create it again because if that same customer wants to order something else, it's gonna be a new order with a new intent ID. So that entity has, has completed its work at this point. The notification service will come along and basically read this new event from Azure Event Hub, and it'll go and format that invoice that we produced into some emails that are gonna be sent to all the appropriate people in our customer's organization and all the appropriate people in the publisher's organization. The publishers are the ones who are selling the product. So we're gonna go ahead and use actors to model this whole state machine because there's lots of things that can go wrong inside this saga. My call to provision this product can fail. Uh, this webhook might take days to fire. Uh, it's also possible that payment might fail to clear the first time, but it might successfully clear the second time. We need to design our actor to be able to go ahead and handle all those possible state transitions. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an order actor. And by the way, I'm not going to show the code for the order actor because there's a no way I could actually fit it on screen. Um, but the order actor can fundamentally use Akadop persistence under the covers. And it's gonna go ahead and say that its entity ID is gonna be equal to the Stripe intent ID. So that way we can correlate this actor's identity to the order that is actually whose payment we're trying to clear inside our payment gateway. All of the internal state for this order actor is going to be event sourced using Akadop persistence from events that are produced by the user service and events 
sensitive by our payment system, Stripe in this case. So every time we receive an event, let's say at the very beginning, a user might change the items in their cart when they're trying to check out. Well, our order actor is going to process that, and it's going to go ahead and uh, recompute the price that the user is going to need to pay. Once the user submits their payment, all those items in the cart are locked. You can't go and modify what's in your cart anymore after that. So we're also not going to bother saving this actor's state to Akadot Persistence until the user attempts to pay. If a user shows up, adds a couple things to their cart, and then leaves, uh, we may not want to necessarily go ahead and save state for that. Uh, maybe there'd be a use case in the future where we start doing things like sending users cart abandonment emails in the event that they uh, um, started an order but never finished it. Something we might try to do. But for the time being, uh, we're going to go ahead and just not operate until the user attempts to run a credit card or attempts to submit a wire transfer. And then we're going to use the Akadotpersistence.Azure uh, library as our backing store. That's going to save all that persistent data to Azure table storage and possibly some of it to Azure blob storage behind the scenes. And then once the order complete event gets published to Azure Event Hub, and that order complete event can only be sent after the user attempts to pay, the payment gets cleared, and we have successfully fulfilled the product. If we fail to fulfill the product, that order is not going to sit in a completed state. We're going to go ahead and keep retrying provisioning that order until either a human being <laughs> manually provisions it in the event the service can't do it automatically, or event that after we retry provisioning the service, that successfully completes. Once we go ahead and publish those events to the Azure Event Hub, knowing they'll be turned into emails and sent to all the appropriate parties, we can go ahead and shut ourselves down, and we don't need to keep our state in memory anymore. The infrastructure we're going to use to build this is we're going to use Akadot Cluster to build the network that's going to host all these actors. This is going to allow us to fault, tolerate, uh, fault, fault tolerantly deploy actors anywhere in our network. So if we are doing deployments or if a node leaves the network, we can go ahead and make sure that all the actors that were on uh, one of the other nodes all get redeployed onto some of the nodes that are still available inside the network somewhere. And then we're also going to go ahead and use Akadot Cluster Sharding. Akadot Cluster Sharding is an abstraction that allows us to guarantee that each entity actor of a particular type will be globally unique, meaning that we can't accidentally end up with multiple copies of our order actor. There can be at most one copy of it anywhere in the network, even when network partitions are happening. And in the event that our, you know, let's say our, our ordering system scales up and down, we can go ahead and move these actors around without losing messages and without losing their data. Finally, we're going to use Akadot Persistence to make it possible for us to move those actors. We make it possible by having the actors save their state as it changes, and then those will automatically attempt to recover their state after a restart or a failure, or maybe after we do a deployment where we take down old copies of the Kubernetes pods and then deploy new ones. And what we'll end up with from an actor hierarchy point of view. Oh, no worries. I'm almost done. Um, so the um, shard region actor here is going to be the actor that's responsible for routing all these events to the correct order actor. And then we have these parents, shard one and shard two. These are all created by Akadot cluster sharding. Underneath these actors are going to be the order actors that I programmed. Those actors will be instantiated on the fly as new Stripe intents are created. Some of these actors can live on node one of the fulfillment service. Others will live on node two. In the event that node one is shut down and node two is the only node left in the cluster, all of these actors would be transparently moved over to node two. And the shard region actor, which by the way, there's one of them on each node, the shard region actor would buffer any of the messages we were trying to send to these order actors in memory until we knew that those actors have been successfully relocated to their new node. So that's how we would go ahead and use Aka.net behind the scenes for some of these services that our companies build managing e-commerce and fulfillment. So in terms of business cases for when to use Aka.net, here's a simple, here's a, a, a not, not a complete list, but a pretty good one. Uh, any type of event-driven application. That's exactly what I just showed you a minute ago. Our ordering system is very much event-driven. Uh, these are really good use cases for Akka.net. 
Finance is another popular case for doing things like dynamic pricing, fraud detection, algorithmic trading. Uh, multiplayer is another really popular area for, for Aka.net. Analytics and monitoring and marketing automation. Uh, these are all types of applications that require you to ingest big streams of data and react to small changes in it at any given time. Uh, doing big systems integrations. So for instance, we have a lot of customers in healthcare they have to go and integrate many different uh, ancient hospital systems together uh, for doing things like patient management, electronic patient records management, or uh, hospital administration. And then we also have a lot of IoT users. That's probably the fastest growing group of Aka.net developers today are people building things like factory automation, power management, uh, managing oil and gas pipelines, that type of thing. So in terms of what's in it for you with the actor model, actors can't be accessed directly through, you know, the, can't, you can't invoke methods or access their state directly. You can only interact with actors by passing the messages. And as a result of this, we get implementation and location transparency. This gives us a healthy separation of concerns and the ability to transparently scale and redeploy actors over a network. Actors work asynchronously by passing strongly typed messages and as a result of, of, of this type of concurrency model, we have less code that we have to write to build a concurrent application, and, and all concurrent concerns are handled automatically. And finally, actors go ahead and process messages serially and first in, first out order, which gives you the ability to make sure your state is always thread safe and requires no locks. So uh, thank you very much for your time today. I know we're just about out. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions uh, either here or in our breakout room that I think we're going to have. And um, yeah, I really appreciate you having me at, at the conference. And uh, I'll be speaking again uh, towards the end of Dot .next with Sergey Baikov, the founder of the Orleans Project. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, I don't think we have questions uh, uh, to ask them right now because it's just a couple of minutes left. Uh, uh, but I, we have some questions to you. I think it's better that we, uh, just in a few minutes, we move to another virtual room. Uh, we both, I guess, received uh, reference to that, links to that. So uh, please uh, join us uh, in the, this backend room, uh, backstage room, in a couple of minutes where uh, we can all uh, talk uh, using Zoom. Yeah, right. Thank you for talk, Aaron and Vagif. And you can move to discussion zone. Yeah. Thank you.